This is episode number 141 of the Mixology Talk podcast, and this week we're talking to bar owner H. Joseph Herman um, of Elixir in San Francisco, one of my personal favorite bars, um, about his 15-year anniversary that just came up, some of the changes he's seen in the drinking culture, and what his perspective is on where it's going. So stay tuned. Well, I'm excited this week as we have a uh, another uh, special guest here. Um, this is somebody that I've um, worked with in the past a long time ago. I don't think I told you this, but um, the Roca Patrona launch event. Yeah. Um, I was one of the other bartenders um, helping yeah. launch that one. Um, but uh, somebody I have a lot of respect for and uh, s- has just celebrated your 15th year anniversary um, as a bar owner in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Excellent. So we have a H. Joseph Ehrman, and if I'm not mistaken, um, people just kind of refer to you as H, right? Yep. Ah, excellent. Um, so, um, yeah, just kind of start us off. Um, what got you into the bar business um, many, many years ago? How did that all start? Well, I started when I was 16. I started as a cook uh, on the Jersey Shore, and mm-hmm. you know, my, my parents had bought a house at the beach, and that first summer... Uh, I literally went to the restaurant on my street and just went in looking for a summer job. Mm -hmm. I was actually hired to be a a bus boy. And the day I shot, I showed up for work, the front of house manager wasn't there and the chef came out and he's like, "Uh, well, Mike's not here. And his his name is Duke. Let's just throw. He went on to, uh, he had worked for Paul Prudhomme and he and Mike, the front of house manager uh, had gone to CIA together and they had just finished and it was mike's family's restaurant so duke was up in new orleans cooking at a new jersey beach seafood restaurant (laughs) that was it was a german restaurant and uh, so they the the family had owned a very famous german restaurant on on the island called the dutchman's brow house and they opened this place it was called ot sea catch and uh so duke was doing cajun food at a german restaurant at the beach (laughs) <laughs> and I got hired. He came out and he was like, well, you know, Mike's not here, but I need a prep cook. You want to learn how to cook? So I was like, sure. So he threw me an apron and started teaching me how to cut carrots and clean potatoes and cut onions. And uh, I mean, I did prep work for a very short period of time before he threw me on the line. And I ended up cooking with him all summer. And um, that was my, you know, dipping my toe in the water in the restaurant industry. And mm-hmm. long story short, from there, I, I just always worked through college and grad school. Uh, I mean, through college, I went to Boston College. And while I was in Boston, I, I, I cooked at a restaurant up there. I worked at, on campus. And uh, when I graduated, I moved to Vail, Colorado. And that's where I, I started bartending. Um, took a summer off my, after my first season in Vail and managed a, a restaurant in Washington, D.C. Went back to, that was my first time managing, which I, uh, one, one late night in the, in the office, uh, we actually had two restaurants. It was called Roxanne and the Peyote Cafe on 18th Street in Adams and Morgan. And I was doing payroll one night and I realized I was the lowest paid person in business. <laughs> in yeah. business. yeah, that'll make you evaluate a couple things for sure, huh? I'm like it was like three in the morning and I'm like I'm still here and I'm making that realization so I was like you know what I'm gonna go back to Vail where uh, I can have a lot of fun and make a lot of money and not manage so I went back I was there for four seasons in total and went on from there to grad school and bartended all through grad school at Thunderbird in Arizona and uh, and then when I got out of grad school with my MBA I had a lot of debt uh, I mo- moved to Madrid and I worked ended up getting a job in Madrid and, and a PR agency where I was for about a year and a half it was two years and um, my father passed away suddenly so I came home to the East Coast to be near my mom and it was mid dot com boom so all my all my friends that stayed in the states from my MBA program were all making money in, in the dot com thing so a friend of one of them got me a job at a software company. Mm-hmm. And I did that for a year, which turned into getting recruited to Silicon Valley into an international position, which was a great job. That brought me to San Francisco, but it only lasted nine months before that company ran out of money and I lost my job like everyone else. And sure enough, I ended up back behind a bar to make rent. And after six months of working in a bar again with an MBA while trying to get a tech job, in the international realm, I just said, what, what am I doing? I don't, I don't like tech. This is the business I know and love, but I've always really been 
uh, a fan of. So yeah. why am I putting my business knowledge into this industry? So I quit that job. I had started a soup company with a high school buddy of mine, and I was consulting some other tech companies on a branding and you know, um, marketing level. So I had like five jobs, and I was just like, screw all this. I wrote a business plan. I raised capital. I, I searched the whole market. Basically, January 2003, I started doing this. I quit everything. I was living on my credit cards. And by, by November, I had bought Elixir, renovated it, and opened on November 21st, 2003. Wow. And 15 years later, here we are, right? Yeah. And, you know, when I, when I bought Elixir and I went to go do that, all I, I had been working in a neighborhood bar, and I'd always worked in neighborhood bars. So mm -hmm. I, I saw the neighborhood bar as something I was really fond of, and also as a, as a business model, something that was really sustainable. Here I was in this post-dot-com, post-9-11 post world where everyone was unemployed, but all the coffee shops and all the bars were packed. Right. So my realization was like the neighborhood bar open 365, you know, if I can make it in my whole idea originally was an, having an exceptional neighborhood bar. And that was what was in my business plan was the exceptional neighborhood bar model. Mm -hmm. So I always strove to do that. Like if you're going to be open 365, you've got to have different ways to get people in every day of the week, make every day, make money, optimize every hour that you're open. So you have to have all these different programs, all these different ideas to make sure that that business flow was, was, was going all the time. And that's what I originally built Elixir as. It had nothing to do with cocktails. I had never heard of mixology, or, you know? Mm -hmm. It's all about hospitality and that third place and that, that warm spot that everybody wants to go to. Sure. And um, if for anybody that is listening here and uh, has never been to Elixir, um, it is a beautiful place. I would say it is the epitome of exactly what you're saying. It's that perfect neighborhood bar that serves really, really good stuff. And everybody that uh, is in there, every time I've gone in, is having a great time. Um, so and uh, so, I think uh, from my end, it's one of my favorite bars in San Francisco. So thank you uh, very much. Yeah, and um, so one of the other things I was going to talk to you about is just kind of like, what? how did that work? How did that happen, like renovating the bar? Because my understanding is that physical building is the second oldest built bar in San Francisco. Yeah, it was, it's interesting because I didn't, again, I wasn't looking for a historic structure or place, mm -hmm. but I had gone through a number of deals before I found that one. And it just happened to be a great deal in that like I, when I walked in the door and I knew it was for sale, I looked at that back bar and I looked, I went across the street and I, and I looked at the outside of the building and I said, these people don't really know what they're sitting on. This is a real deal, old West saloon. Mm -hmm. So I made my offer and when I got it and I was able to get the property as well, it was a package deal. The property was for sale, which is never, you know, very rarely the case. Um, sure. and, a, and it's been a lifesaver in this market where so many, especially even classic, uh, you know, kind of stalwart legacy bars have, have lost their business or their location because of increasing rents. And I sure. don't deal with that because I have a loan that rent and it's mm -hmm. stable. And, um, but when I looked at it, I was just like, this is a, this is a, a beautiful place. And I, I didn't, I didn't renovate it. I restored it. I didn't okay. rent anything out, but it is, it's actually the, it's the second oldest saloon location in the city. I always use that word because it, it the original saloon burned down in 1906. Okay. The rest of the city. And so what's there was built in 1907. The back bar and bar themselves predate the building. They are late 19th century, hand-carved, mahogany, um, beautiful pieces of furniture. Uh, obviously came in from another part of the, the city or outside the burn zone. It's possible that they were the original bar from the original, but it, there's no, there are no burn marks on it whatsoever. Uh, I refinished that entire thing by hand myself. Mm -hmm. There were no burn marks, uh, but it does have a plaque on it that indicates it came from the San Francisco store and office fixture company, which with a, with a street address, literally across the street and up the block. And that company did come back after the fire mm -hmm. at a different location. So it, that piece of furniture came from that store across the street from when it, from beforehand. So I don't know, where it came from, how it got there, but sure. and, it's, and it's not drawn in. When you look at the walls of the bar, I have the original architect's drawings framed from 1907. Oh wow! And you can see in one of them there's a complete layout of the saloon because Patrick McGinnis, who owned the place from 1890, uh, 1894, 19, 1893 till 1933 for 40 years, 
he had owned it for 16, for 13 years before it burned down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can tell from the, from the, the, the building, you know, the original building that was there was smaller and the saloon was smaller. And I have the pre um, 1906 city planning maps that show what the building looked like on a you know, square, like what it looked like from above. But um, he basically, he rebuilt that and he, was just, he put a lot of detail in the planning into the saloon. And and, uh, and of course the apartments and stuff. So he, he built a bigger building and wrapped apartments around it. And he hired the, an architect who would be go, would go down in history as one of the most significant architects in Northern California history. So it's not only historic in its time and its place and all that, but the architect involved. And so it's a really it's a cool property. Yeah, and uh, how how important is it to kind of keep that legacy moving forward? Because I've talked to quite a few. Um, bar owners that have old properties and it's something they always have a lot of pride in telling the story of the bar um how yeah. important is that piece to to you in the in owning this bar it's everything like you know everything that i've dug up in the, the history of the of the bar is was, unco was uncovered before me there have been it's not a it's a i i named it elixir because what i bought was called jack's elixir bar and I found the elixir name in that to be something I could tie back to the recent history and, uh, and to the, like the history of the old West and, you know, snake oil salesmen selling elixirs off the back of wagons and the role that alcohol played in that, what elixirs were, are. Um, so I did a lot of research in the last 15 years in order to tell the story, to uncover everything that's happened there. And I've made a lot of investment in, uh, physically restoring the place, both the exterior of the building. I managed the entire rest, uh, renovation of the or restoration of the facade of the building a couple of years ago mm -hmm. for the homeowners association of my building. And we spent a lot of extra money. We actually had to have 15 different moldings on the exterior of the wow. building. Re, had to have, in order to repair water damage, I had to have them remade custom, like custom um, recreations of those original moldings because they're not stock. You can't buy them at a lumber yard. Sure, so I spent a lot of money doing that. Um, and then we got a, a historic plaque from the, uh, the Clampers, E. Clampus Vitus, uh, uh, last year. Now, so now we have a historic plaque on there. We're about to get legacy bar status from the city. Wow. We've been listed as a leg legacy bar by the San Francisco Architectural um, uh, Foundation. And so there's a lot of these things that now I've, I've, cement, I've, I've rebuilt the story and I've cemented the declarations and, and everything of, about this. So my hope is that whether or not I can hand this bar down to my daughter, keep it in the family forever long, my hope is that in the long term, it will never undergo another name change or, you know, maybe it'll do another name change, but as long as the history of it being a historic San Francisco saloon is retained, I'll be happy. Nice. I don't want to say it's been, it was a gay bar from, in a gay Latino bar from like 85 to 89. It was a beer bar in the nineties. It was a, uh, a merchant Marine dive bar from 65 to 85 called Swedes. So it always had different, had different names and owners and kind of, you know, themes. I was the first one to bring it back to what it originally was, which was a Victorian era saloon. And sure. so my hope is that that's what it'll stay. <laughs> Now, do you have any favorite memories from kind of when you opened this place to uh, to present day? Because I know you just went through your 15 year um, celebration, um, but uh, anything that really stands out for you? Uh, well, my five year anniversary party, I met my wife. Or I That's a good memory. Started dating dating her from that point on. So, uh -huh. so it's always a little bit of a problem with us in that bar anniversary has to be celebrated as a business <laughs> event and it, it always coincides you know with our our anniversary so that always gets bumped so that's a little sure thing in our house um <laughs> uh and then there's uh, uh the, the period of time when i was in there all the time you know the first five years or so when i was basically bartending seven days a week and I was single. I wasn't single when I opened it, but I soon became single because <laughs> you know, I opened it. I think. Right. And I was just work, you know, working your ass off, starting something. There's, there's a, that period of time was, was a unique part of my life where I, everything kind of came together for me. I had, 
bartended throughout my 20s. I did my, I did my bachelor's degree. I did my MBA. All the time that I was bartending in my 20s and early 30s, I was, I was well, not early 30s, because that's when I did my MBA. But in my 20s, I was also contracting. So I, I built homes. I, I worked for contractors, had my own painting company. So everything kind of came together for me with this. You know, I used mm-hmm. my MBA to form the company, to raise the capital, to get the thing going. I used my time in Spain and PR to, to build the story of what Elixir would be. And I knew that when I opened it, I didn't have, in order to tell the story, you have to have a story to tell. So when I opened, you know, just opening a bar is not much of a story. But right. as, a, as I strategically made the decision to, to go into handcrafted cocktails and, and got rid of all of my um, pre-made mixers and, and I started collecting tequila originally and then whiskey, uh, all of these moves were based on the idea of having a story to tell at a time that was very uh, fortunate for me. I was, I was, I made this, I, I started doing this when no one else was doing it. So I was one of those first people to be, to make good drinks and take a stand against poor quality products and support the very nascent stage uh, craft spirit movement and bring in w- weird ingredients like Delmagay mezcal I've been selling for probably 13, 14 years now and mm-hmm. making good friends at Ron Cooper early on and uh, all of the local distillers like Marco Carrick said, you know, um, the St. George crowd and the Anchor crowd, 209. It was, you know, all of that was, it, it took on a life of its own. So suddenly sure. it, it brought me out of the bar and into more of the community. And then the community grew from the Bay Area to a national level, to an international level. And so those earliest days were probably the most memorable as a period. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you kind of touched upon something I want to uh, quick kind of talk about and just kind of the evolution that you've seen in the craft uh, spirit movement mixology, if you want to call it that, um, you know, how when you started it was like you said just kind of in the beginning um there wasn't a lot of people doing what you were doing with fresh juices and all that and san francisco was kind of the hub for you know for that and new york and a couple other hot spots um but i'm hoping you can kind of talk about some of the changes that you've seen um in this cocktail scene that we've that we've had over the 15 years well yeah i mean the the, it was, you know, early on called the California style, what I was doing and, mm-hmm. you know, me and Scott Beatty and Marco and Isis and, you know, and Dave, um, Dave Nipov. And we were, you know, smashing something in a glass. And there's some quotes about me out there about that. Like I have a David Wonders quote where, from Esquire where I, that I used my marking. Like you can always find something deliciously smashed in a glass or something like that. <laughs> Um, and it was because we were leveraging the fact that we had this access to produce and, and that, you know, the produce that people were using in other markets was coming from here. And so we had amazing farmers markets and we had this culinary culture that was worth leveraging. And mm. in New York, they weren't doing that at that time. And New York was, they didn't have the same access to, there was obviously good produce there, but they didn't have the season, the, the long running seasons and, and, the, and all of that. And they didn't have as many farmers markets. And they were for, focused more on the classics and, and mixing, finding flavors in the bottle. And we were finding flavors outside of the bottle and bringing them into the glass, you know, mm-hmm. whether it was infusing tea or muddling something or pureeing it. And, you know, so it was, it's interesting to see how like that, the culinary approaches we were using early on uh, evolved and spread to where now the, you know, there was no, within a very short period of time, those regional differences went away and everybody was like we started doing more classic stirred boozy drinks out here and they started using more produce and on right. the coast and, and everything kind of came together you know and i spent you know like 2006 7 i started traveling the country for square one organic spirits and um training people about the role of vodka and organics and pro fresh produce and i also was one of the first certified green businesses in the, in the city. I was the first bar in the country to have any kind of green certification. So I was teaching people about green business practices operationally and with, you know, the bottom line benefits of that kind of thing. And so I was going out and literally teaching people how to squeeze limes and make simple syrup rather than buying simple syrup and buying sour mix and basic things like that were, that were just the first steps of, of bringing up the quality of a drink. And then I wasn't the only one, obviously, and, and there were 
Tony and Dale and Gary and everybody ahead of me. And then people came up, you know, the people were my, my peers at the time frame and people came up from behind me and it just grew so exponentially, so much quicker than I think any of us ever expected it to. You know, we say like, why can't people get this? Why can't we just do these simple things and make a good drink? It was seemed like we were banging our heads against the wall. And then all of a sudden it was like overnight, it just exploded. And, right. um, and once you get people, once you get creative people interested in a creative opportunity, it's amazing to see what they've done. I and mean, the things that bartenders are doing today, I've, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not even going to try that. Like, <laughs> I'd just rather drink your drink because that's really cool. <laughs> right, absolutely. Like, well, how did you think of that? Because that's amazing. Congratulations. I'll have another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was a little bit later. I think I started tending bar in 2003 um, up in Sonoma. And I was kind of watching what was happening in San Francisco because that was one of the biggest markets for it. And, um, you know, it was incredible to see how passionate people were and how small of a group you guys had in San Francisco and were doing such fun things. I remember Rye was, if I remember correctly, Rye Bar uh, was doing a, like a Mixology Monday contest or something like that. Oh, it's great to show up and just have a great time. And they're like, man, I can't wait to go to San Francisco. Yeah, I mean, John and Greg were like unsung heroes of this whole thing to this day. That You know, they don't get enough credit for what they did. Sure. It was like their Monday, their Monday cocktail competitions was like beyond, beyond the USBG meetings, which they were like, I think I was member number 16 or something. You know, so just a couple dozen of us at most for quite a while that would get together for USBG meetings. And then... But every Monday, we would all gather at Rye, and that's where ideas were exchanged. So like, right. you know, like, that's where you, like, you held your new idea to present it in that drink on that Monday, and then you'd then be like, wait, what, what did he just do there? Like, wait, 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 what was that? Where'd you get that? Oh, yeah. Chinatown, or, you know, I've read about it, you know. You know, my mother used to have one of these. <laughs> all these weird things, and people would come up with stuff, and it'd be like, wow, that's amazing. Right. Uh, and I, I learned a lot from Greg and John on a business level too from that time because they, you know, they once if you won the competition, they put that drink on the menu. So they they did a lot of things that that embraced the community and promoted the community and promoted the creativity, and it, and it went back to everybody's bars and sure. everybody started doing. It. We used back then, you know, we used to we used to always used to say to the press like a big difference between us and the and the East Coast mm-hmm. and New York in particular back then was that we sat at each other's bars and we. We shared ideas and we talked about these things. We're in New York, and I'm from Jersey. You know, the, the East Coast mentality of the, the old restaurant seems like you, you kept everything tight. You kept your secrets right. to yourself, and it was all competitive. And it's like, oh, I'm not, that's that's my secret sauce, mm-hmm. you know. And but whereas out here, it was a different it was a different atmosphere. And again, that that changed pretty quickly. I, mean, I remember how in New York they they resisted having a USBG chapter for so long. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jonathan Kogash and a few others pushed and and brought a community together. And now, you know, now the national president is from New York. And you know, now I don't, I don't even know how many chapters there were. There were like three, right? When I started, now there's yeah, like sixty or seventy or something like that. Yeah, I think when I started the USBG, uh, when I joined, I think there was like forty people in San Francisco. Now I don't even know how many hundreds of bartenders are in the USBG oh, in San Francisco. Like, like six hundred or something in San Francisco. Chapter. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's amazing to see kind of this evolution and kind of this uh, collaboration that's really exploded this this community. It's it's pretty incredible to see how, to your point, how fast it happened and uh, how much different it is now. Um, you know. You used to be able to keep track of like who just did something cool and new and like right. you could see that the rising stars coming up and now it's just like it's a flood there's too many i mean everyone's doing it it's, it yeah absolutely yeah no I, I in the beginning i tried to keep track of you know same thing who's doing what and where and, and now it's just like okay who won that contest what was the cocktail because that's kind of the only insight you have on a you know yeah. almost a, a, a national level too you know um that's pretty crazy. So um, as far as like drinking trends go, um, what is something that you're kind of excited to see happening in the next, you know, foreseeable future? A couple of things, I guess right now in the San Francisco market in particular, as far as how people drink, there's been, a, there's a, there's a big shift that the industry's changed quite a bit because the consumer has changed quite a bit and mm-hmm. people don't drink 
the same way they did just five years ago. And uh, you know, not to sound like an old man, I say like kids today, but <laughs> <laughs> younger people today don't drink like I did, like me and my generation. Like, and, and it's been a shift that's just happened in the last several years. I can tell yeah. you, just fix your loan. The days of people coming me coming in and being like fifteen shots for me and my friends, you know, and then and then they're like, okay, now we'll get drinks. Like, right. Those days seem to be kind of over. <laughs> people don't drink like that anymore. Instead, you've got like twenty-two year olds coming in and be like, "You have any pappy?" Oh wow! You know, we're like, "Oh, is that that Kalila? Where did that, what year is that? I'm not sure if I've had that one yet." You know, they're, they're not afraid to drop fifty, seventy-five dollars a glass on something. Wow! It Which is, a lot it's of, great. And I don't know if it's and honestly, I don't know if it's just a San Francisco thing because the the tech bubble here is so weird and. These people are making 150, 200 grand out of college, or you know, or few, yeah. within a few years out of college, it's it's a whole new dynamic. And so, as a business, it, you know, you, you got to roll with that. We have so much more competition now than we had several years ago as well. So you have to have different, you have to have new differentiators to get people in the door. And uh, so there's a lot of that as far as like where drinking is going. It's like trying as a business person to figure out how people are drinking and where they're going is more challenging than I think I've ever seen in my whole career. Sure. That's one thing. Um, as far as drinks go, as the, the cocktail thing really took off and I, and I started to see like, okay, we lit a fire and now it's a bonfire. I realized quickly that I don't know that I want to play this game. I don't want to be in this rat race to always have, the next hot cocktail and be the next cocktail on the cover. Like the competition for that got immense. And, you know, I felt like we'd done our job. We, we had made, we inspired people to, to get involved and take bartending seriously as a career mm -hmm. and, and do stuff. And it was obviously going well. And I was personally getting more interested in spirits. And so that's when I started doing and having done a lot of education through my role with square one, I started picking up other education things and I, and, I shifted my consultancy, my consultancy to professional bartender education and spirits company product development and, and, and that. So I've had some fun working for the Authentic Caribbean Rum program and I, you know, the, the BNIC being a cognac educator. And I'm on, uh, uh, in two days, I'm headed to Armagnac to study Armagnac for a week with BNIA. And so I'm really right now into brandy. Uh, mm. and I, Still really, I mean, obviously, I have a whiskey bar. I love my whiskey, um, but I'm really right now. Brandy and rum are two things that I I really passionate about, and I, I think that are are coming up pretty quickly. So uh, I'd like to see that, especially having a whiskey bar because whiskey is so hot, and I, it's I, it's kind of like a um, what do you call it? like a gateway drug to <laughs> to other age spirits, people, right? especially bourbon, like Americans are so big on bourbon right now. And I think what they're learning through bourbon is what barrel aging does, what the effect of the wood is. And especially since so many other spirits use used bourbon barrels, right. you can, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good segue to get people like, Oh, you like that? Well, you know, maybe you like those flavor notes. We'll come check out what you can do with, with the grape or with the apple or with the agave or, you know, right. And so I, I find for myself a lot more uh, interesting opportunities through spirits because cocktails are, are to me almost passe already. Like go back to the simple, you know, the simple drinks. We sell tons and tons of old fashions, like a lot of people, yeah. you know, little tweaks on the old fashioned from, a, again, from a business perspective, I want to sell volume drinks. I want to sell a lot of drinks. And so I have an amazing staff right now. We're coming up with really good inventive cocktails. And I love having those. And I love putting those out and get, you know, having them on the scene. So that's, again, it provides a balance. I think, you know, really good cocktails are going to, are here to stay. You're right. So you've got to be able to compete with that. But uh, I think straight spirits are, are where there's still a lot of really good opportunity for people to, explore flavor and, and passion and story and history and production and there's something for everybody in, in the story of the spirit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that cognac really embodies that. Um, I've uh, talked to a couple of master blenders um, just through USBG meetings and, and uh, a couple of other things. And it's always amazing the history that's tied to a cognac house mm -hmm. and how far back their libraries go and the stories they can tell on, 
almost any vintage yeah. um, is always incredible. I remember, I think I talked to somebody in the either, I think it was a Remy house and I, and I asked the master blender, what's your favorite vintage and, and why? And he said there was one that happened right during world war one. Um, and he's tried it and it happened right at the beginning of the harvest. So all the men were out fighting. Um, so the entire harvest was picked by women. Yeah. So the difference between that vintage versus any other vintage that was harvested by by men was absolutely noticeable and remarkably different. And after that, I was like, wow, that's incredible. And I started talking to a couple other people in the wine business and they're like, oh yeah, that's common practice now in, in up in Napa and you know, some of these other places. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but you know, just like little tiny s- snippets of history like that and you know, all the things they had to endure um, yeah. through, through all the world wars is just absolutely incredible. And um, one of my favorite spirits, and I think it doesn't get a lot of recognition that something you touched on, that's Armagnac. Um, yeah. I think as far as like a really beautiful rustic spirit, uh, Armagnac really doesn't have many competitors in, in its class, in my opinion. And you want to talk vintage? I mean, Armagnac's all about vintage. And Cognac's all about blending. Right. You know, I'm I'm expecting next week to have quite a quite a full trip. <laughs> sure. A lot of cool, good stuff. I'm really excited about. It. And then when I come back, hopefully, I'll be doing some Armagnac education for them. And so it'll be it'll be fun to share that. Absolutely. No, that's great. Um, so uh, no, that's. It's amazing. Thank you for kind of the recap of kind of the history of San Francisco cocktail scene and kind of the evolution of kind of where we came from and all that. And uh, how was the party at Elixir, uh, the 15 year? Oh, it was, it was phenomenal. It was, you know, it was fun because it just rolled all day and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was great to have 4505 there because Ryan Farr actually lives next door to Elixir. And so oh, wow. he's been a neighbor and friend and regular for many years since before he started 4505 and he launched he launched his his chicharrones with elixir and uh you know we, we sold him by the bag when he first started making them and, and when he quit he was when he quit working for elizabeth faulkner at orson to become a butcher uh and he was teaching at a uh non-profit teaching butchery that he as he was learning it himself and i went mm-hmm. out and, uh, with my uh girlfriend and uh, we butchered a pig and made a, a porchetta together that we oh. served. We, we cooked in my backyard and served at my, my employee holiday party. And that was before he even started his company. So we've been, you know, we've been friends for years and they've done many of our anniversary parties. So those guys were all, they're part of the family and it was great. They had a really great team there and, and we had tons of food and it was fun because people just rolled in and out throughout the day, and, you know, come for a drink or two and on off to the next thing. And, so it was a great party. Awesome. Well, um, I know you're a busy man. I know you probably have to pack for uh, France and get all your things in line. Um, so thank you for your time. I definitely appreciate it. Um, now, is there anything you want to promote on your end? Um, sorry for the voice. Yeah, yeah. I I'm not in puberty right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we've got some fun new stuff going on at the bar. At least uh, um, on Monday nights, we've got Vince Lund behind the bar. It was a... a, a just a great uh, San Francisco bartender has been around for quite a while, kind of my, my generation of bartenders. And he's, he's just amazing. He worked in New Orleans for quite a while at Arno's French 75. And so it, it, I'm really psyched to have him in for, for industry nights. It's, that's been building. So for the bartenders that want to come meet a great bartender and, and, uh, and have a, a great industry scene, that's going really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's but, on Wednesdays, you said? No, Mondays. Mondays, great. Mondays from nine o'clock on, and then um, we, we just have a great crew right now. It's, I'm really excited about my team, and they're all. Uh, we just got um, Deb in from. She used to be at Homestead for like 20 years, and now she, she came over and is working with us on Thursday and Sunday nights. So she's bringing a great crowd in for that. And she used to be a, a baker, so she, you know her her pastry and baking background, which plays into her cocktails, which are great. And um, all my team. They're, they're, they're all we're, we've got a killer squad right now and then we're, we're launching a uh, a whiskey club oh. I've, got over, I've got over 600 whiskeys in the bar and uh, i started a whiskey club called whiskey geeks you can sign up for on our website elixirsf.com and right now it's just the first level of that is uh i'm doing two 
membership levels. I'm calling a one bit member and a two bit member. And the one bit member is basically just getting on the email list. And so there will be sp specific promotions for anyone who's on the list. And then a two bit membership will be a paid membership and that's going to have its own benefits. And that'll launch in Q1 next year. I'm just kind of molding the back end operationally and mm -hmm. financially, but that's going to cost and all that. So, so that's your big next big thing is launching whiskey geeks. Oh, that sounds awesome. And uh, it sounds like you've been collecting quite a bit of whiskey over the years. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the point is I've got a lot of whiskey on the shelves that people don't dip into 600 something bottles. And I would say there's, you know, 30 or 40 that go in regular rotation. So there's some amazing bottles up there that people aren't getting into. So part of the club, the whole idea is to like expose people to these other bottles and get them drinking them and trying different things. Cause sure. Um, Nick and I, you know, procure that entire collection and we taste everything and make every decision on every bottle that we buy based on its unique position within the overall collection. Sure. Yeah. And I imagine there's some, uh, some pretty amazing stories in each bottle, oh, yeah. many of the bottles in, um, in that collection too. Yeah. Uh, excellent. So, um, what's the best way for people to kind of reach out to you, kind of keep updated with what you guys are doing in there? Um, favorite social media handles or anything like that? Yeah, at Elixir SF, E L I X I R S F. A lot of people misspell Elixir, throwing an E in there. Um, and there's no E in any spelling, in any language. <laughs> uh, so, at Elixir SF uh, is our both uh, Twitter and Instagram. And then uh, backslash Elixir Saloon is the Facebook page. So, uh, those are the best ways right now uh, to keep up with everything. I'm, I'm pretty active on, on putting up new events. We have different event postings through um, the Facebook event function. And I've, I've started putting stuff on Eventbrite too. So we're going to have some cool upcoming uh, tastings and uh, guided tastings. Anytime we have like distiller tastings in our classroom, which seats 17 people, we do ticketed events on elixirsf.eventbrite.com. So that's Great. rule of our event. We don't have anything. We have some stuff coming up in Q1. I'm lining up some really cool stuff. We did a lot of really cool stuff for Whiskey Fest. Um, you know, anytime any big whiskey distiller or brand master comes to town, we try to put something special together in there and, and keep the ticket price low to make it really accessible. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so I'll include those links in our show notes um, for anybody that wants to uh, get in contact with you. Um, and like I said, thank you so much for your time. and. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you again. Yeah, for sure. All right. Excellent, thank you. All right, thank you. So thanks again to H for taking the time and chatting with us about kind of the history of the cocktail movement as he's seen it in San Francisco and also to get his perspective on where things are headed. Uh, definitely insightful. And uh, if you're ever in San Francisco um, in the mission looking for a great place to drink, like I said, uh, Elixir is definitely one of my favorite bars, so you definitely want to check that out. We'll have links to all the things we mentioned in the show notes over at mixologytalk.com 141. Now, if you haven't joined the Facebook community that we started, the Craft Bartender community, um, I highly recommend you uh, going to check it out. Um, every week or pretty much every day we have a really interesting conversation um, everything from beginning bartending to super advanced techniques um, I think some of the ones recently were how long can you hold a bottle of wine for for service and questions on clarifying milk punch and proper techniques for that or best techniques for that so a whole bunch of different information happening um, you'll find links to that on our website abarabub.com you can also find it on Facebook when you look up craft bartender community so uh hopefully you'll join and we'll have some more podcasts for you in the future until then cheers everyone